worship team for leading us this morning. I want to invite you to open your copy of God's Word with me to the book of Psalms. We are looking uh, over the summer in the book of Psalms. We're today in Psalm chapter 3. Psalm 3. Psalm 3. The other day, Friday evening, I went out into our our yard and uh, uh, just walked around a little bit in the grass, and the grass crunched underneath my feet. You guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, it was crispy. And I, I moved my foot, and as I looked at the crispy lawn that I have, I could see the grass beneath my feet like disintegrating. And so I, I kind of kicked my leg in the grass, and basically it all turned to dust. And there I'm looking at my yard, and I'm not sure at the end of summer that I'm going to have any grass left in my yard. And then there's a neighbor down the street, and their grass is perfectly green. What's the difference? Well, obviously, that guy's watering his lawn quite a bit more than I am. That lawn is getting something that that my lawn is not getting. And so there's, I think, a lesson for us in life about this, just taking the simple illustration of the weather outside. So picture the sun beating down mercilessly on us. You don't have to do much imagination. Just step outside and do that today. That represents, I think, the trials that come to us in life the furnace of affliction that comes. And it comes to all of us in various ways at various times. You may be going through just a a wonderful time in your life right now. You might be on vacation. You might be having the time of your life. But you may also be today, if that's you, uh, know that there's some affliction coming in your life. And I don't want you to end up like my crispy lawn because that's what happens to some people right the trials come the afflictions come and even believers people in the church we're not exempt to this from this we still sometimes react the the, the, the pressure is on and we just disintegrate we just crumble and so what i want to do today is provide some nutrients and some encouragement some life and spiritual vitality to you so that you could say similar to the words we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, I love this passage of Scripture. It says that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. How could you have that kind of faith in the, in the, in the face of persecution, in the face of obstacles, in the face of trials? Well, Psalm chapter 3 goes a long way in equipping us for how to face those kinds of things in life. And so that's what we're going to look at today on having a conquering faith from Psalm chapter 3. Would you stand with me as we read God's Word together, Psalm chapter 3? I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. I encourage you to follow along on the screen or in your copy of God's Word, Psalm 3. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. If you are someone who takes note, just verse 4 is really key. We're going to come back to that, okay? I'm having trouble not just starting to preach right here. Verse 4, we're going to come back to it. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to to the Lord, your blessing be upon your people. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just ask today that as we read your word, you'd help us to understand. The greatest need of every single one of us in this room today is to, to hear 
from you. Lord, we may not have walked into this room with that desire, with that need known to us, but Lord, today that's what we need. We need to hear from you. So Lord, today we're asking that you would speak to us. God, we're asking that you'd give us ears to hear. And we pray that you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Psalm 3 is the beginning of a section of psalms. Psalm 1 and 2 are the introduction to the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, we looked at, deals with, from a standpoint of the individual, a godly man. And it contrasts two, two people in two ways. What, what is it like to follow the Lord? What is it like to reject the Lord? Psalm chapter 2 gives to us a, a broader picture, talking about how our God is Lord even over the nations. And so we need to understand God is 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 Lord both in our lives personally and even over the nation. So we have both of those things in hand as we proceed to Psalm chapter 3. And what Psalm chapter 3 is what theologians call, theologians call it a lament. And there are various kinds of laments in Scripture, but basically the, the general idea of a, a lament, if you were to let me summarize the plot of a lament, is this. A lament says and expresses this feeling. My enemies are too strong. My enemies are too strong. Or you could, you could make it uh, less personal. You could say my obstacles are too great right now. I am too weak. So my enemies are too strong. I am too weak. And God is absent. That's what a lament expresses. It expresses this feeling that my enemies are too strong, I am too weak, and I do not feel that God is with me. That's what Psalm 3 is expressing. And so you see especially those terms in verses 1 and 2. Now, what is, we we see from the, the, the superscription there in Psalm 3, that this is a Psalm of David. So what is David expressing here? What is he conveying? What is he dealing with that he feels the need To lament. What is he facing? Sometimes it's helpful to understand the context and the backstory. And so Psalm chapter 3, there is a great story. The first thing that David was expressing, he's experiencing really two things that he's conveying here in verses 1 and 2. The first is opposition and hostility. And that could be an understatement of the year. So David He's a man after God's own heart, yet the scripture tells us, and this story is found, if you want to read this later today, this is your homework for this afternoon, I want you to go back and read, Um, you can can go back in in 2 Samuel beginning in chapter 11 and on through uh, chapter 15, you can read this story of David, and so even though he's a, a godly man, even though he's a man that God called to be on the throne, he has the purposes of God, he is part of God's plan, he's also someone who sins greatly against God, and In 2 Samuel 11, David commits adultery with Bathsheba. And and from that point, David's life and his family life becomes more like a soap opera than the story of a man of God. And so David, he has, in addition to Bathsheba, he already has uh, multiple wives. Uh, Never a good idea. Never prescribed in Scripture. Nevertheless, there he is. So David has children by these various wives and so he has a son whose name is Amnon he has another son whose name is Absalom and he has and those are by different parents and Amnon has a sister who is by the 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 same mother and her name is Tamar and so within this family you have this uh, sordid kind of situation I'm sorry I misspoke that is Absalom's sister so Tamar is Absalom's sister and so for some of for you Bible scholars who are going to catch me on that. And so as this family situation plays out, what happened was Amnon became obsessed and infatuated with his half-sister. And he obsessed over and he began to long for her and he desired her. And, and, and one day, through the encouragement of an evil man who happened to be a friend of his, he actually raped his half-sister sister and you think your family's got drama you think your family's got problems this was just the beginning so Amnon rapes Tamar and then Absalom Tamar's brother hears about it David hears about it David's enraged but yet 
he does nothing. He's just angry about it. He doesn't confront it. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't uh, work any kind of uh, retribution. He just kind of ignores the whole situation. He's very passive in the whole thing. And so eventually Absalom plots his revenge. And he creates a scenario whereby his revenge could be exacted and, and he has Amnon killed. And so Absalom then murders Amnon. So all this is taking place in David's family. And so this sordid scene. And so then David is now, he is not just, uh, he, he's not just at a distance from his son Amnon. Now he's at a distance from Absalom as well. And he's banished from the kingdom. Then later David recalls him, brings him home, but doesn't speak to him. They're not on speaking terms for two years. He lives in close proximity to him, and there's no interaction whatsoever. And finally, Absalom has enough. He's handsome. He's charismatic. And so he begins every day. He would position himself. He would go into the city gates, and that's where you would conduct business. And so in our day, it's almost like you know, what you'd have at the local coffee shop or somewhere where people gather and conduct business, right there in the city gates where they would gather and, and people would come with their petitions for the king. But what Absalom would do is very crafty. He would be ready there. He'd be the one there to meet all these people who would come with matters to present the king. And, and Absalom would say something like this. This is from 2 Samuel 15. Absalom would say, well, you know, uh, there's no one here to hear you from the king. But if I were king, let me tell you what I would do. I would do something about your situation. And so over time, as day by day, different people brought their needs, the word began to get around and people began to look with favor on Absalom. And so after some time of doing this, the time was right. In fact, Scripture says, uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 6, that he stole the hearts of the people. Meanwhile, David, the king, has no idea that this is taking place. And so at the right time, Absalom enforces and executes his coup. He has David uh, just run out of the city. In fact, David has to flee for his very life out of the city. The whole population, the kingdom turns on him. That was how effective Absalom was in his campaign. And so Psalm 3 is written in the midst of that kind of opposition, that kind of pressure, that kind of hostility, the kind of hostility that would make you run for your very life. That's where David is writing this. And so when he says in verse 1, O oh Lord, how, how my adversaries have increased, that's what he's expressing. One day in his mind, he's the king and everything is going somewhat well. The next day, everyone is rising up against him plotting his destruction and his overthrow, including his own son. That's what he's going through. That's what he's feeling. That's the kind of opposition he's facing. And not only that, but look at what else you see he expresses here. He's going through this opposition. Many are rising up against me. But he's also facing, in verse 2, if that weren't enough, he's facing mockery. He's facing mockery. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. David, you're God's man. You're God's anointed. Apparently God doesn't love you. Apparently God doesn't care much for you because look at the mess you're in right now, David. So that's the scenario. So he's facing this, this mockery. In fact, he has people, even as he's fleeing for his life, a man named Shammai comes up to him. And curses David to his face, curses the king to his face as he's fleeing for his life and essentially tells him, David, all of this is your fault. You brought this on yourself and you deserve this. So that's what he's going through. So he's not just having a bad day. He's not just going through a, a, a season where he's a little bit discouraged. He's going through the darkest time of life. And so uh, you may be there, you may be experiencing something that feels like this, or you may have some minor problems in comparison, but wherever you fall in this, understand that Psalm 3 is written. It's a psalm that can equip any one of us to face those things. And so he comes away from this. He doesn't actually stay very long in what we call the lament. Verses 1 and 2, that's the lament, look at verse 3, things change gears quite rapidly in this psalm. 
This is why I love this word. So, so if you're like, man, I hope we don't camp out much there on that, much more on that discouragement, on that opposition. No, we're not, because David doesn't either. Look at what he does, and remember what he's facing. Remember the seriousness of this. But look at what he says in verse 3. He changes gears. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. What does he do in verse 3? He shifts his attention from his problems to his God. He moves his focus from all this happening, all of his enemies, all the troubles and the trials that he's facing. He moves his focus to the God he knows who loves him. He expresses a confidence in God. And it's simply this. And, and if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down because if you want to summarize the, what this psalm equips us in, and then we're going to take some time after I, I give you this, this statement and explain some of the reasons why and the foundations and the building blocks for this. But here's what David is expressing. Here's what he's saying. He's saying it's, it's this, is that when God is your confidence, he will sustain you. When God is your confidence, when the Lord Jesus Christ is your confidence, he will sustain you. Now, how can you come to that? How can you experience, even to the degree that David was facing of his very kingdom turning against him, his own son turning against him, the hostility, the mockery, how could you experience all that and still have confidence in God? Well, the key is, remember I said verse 4 was really important? That's going to help us understand how David could have this kind of confidence. So look at what he says about God in verse 3. This is how he moves from lament to confidence. This is how he moves and, and grows in his faith to deal in difficult circumstances. Look what he says. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. Man, isn't that a great imagery for the Lord? So he's not talking about some, some piddly kind of little armor that he's got he's talking about you're a shield about me he says lord even though i'm faced with all these enemies all this opposition you are a shield around me you're protecting me and this is some some important insight for us to get here we have an idea some people have an idea that if i follow the lord i will not face trouble or trials or problems or setbacks or opposition or mockery or persecution or any of those things let me tell you something that is not true Nothing will discourage you more in your faith than for you to believe that if you just follow the Lord, if you just obey the Lord, everything is going to happen the way you want it to. The reality is, if you follow the Lord, sometimes you will face situations much like what David found himself in. What are we to do? Are we to conclude that there's something wrong with the Lord? No, David understood this. He said, God doesn't keep us from battles. He protects us in the midst of them. And so that's the insight we need to gather in this. And so he says, Lord, if you've put me here, if you've placed me in this situation, if you'd allow me to experience this, I know that you're going to protect me. You're a shield about me. I love that imagery of the Lord. That's a great verse to memorize, to put on your heart. Say, Lord, you're a shield about me look at this he says you're my glory and the one who lifts up my head now remember david has just had his kingdom completely swept out from under his feet he has you talk about david's glory from his relationship with bathsheba the adultery all the things that david has done which are very public sins and now this failing in his own family this murder, all that has gone on inside of his own home and now losing the kingdom, David, as the king, could not be more humiliated. You want to talk about failure, that's where David was. He has no glory. If you look at his accomplishments as a king, he's got some good accomplishments, but <laughs> But you look at what's going on in his life, there is no way David is looking at this moment in his life as he's fleeing for his very life, as people are cursing him and mocking him. There's no way he's thinking, well, I've, I've done some good things. The economy's okay. No, his, he is, is, he's lost all of his glory. But yet he says, Lord, you're my glory. He says, you're the lifter of my head. And so what he's, what he's looking to is his understanding is over the long haul. He understands that the way God works, he says, you know, there will be a time that I'm going to trust in him. God is the one. He talks about lifting his head. In other words, God will restore him. 
And so, God, I'm just going to trust in you to get me through this situation, to bring me through to the other side, to take me through and help me get through this. And so that is his confidence is in the Lord. Now, where on earth does that confidence come from? Is David just born with something special that you and I don't have? No, look at verse 4. I told you it was important. Here it is. How does he get this? Here's the conviction. This is the first building block to where we understand that if the Lord is our confidence, he will sustain us. Here's the first building block. Look at what he says. I was crying to the Lord with my voice. Listen. And what? He what? Answered. He answered me. So his first conviction that, that helps build this confidence, this, this is a foundation for, for our faith, is the fact that David believed that God hears us when we pray. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God hears when we pray? That is the difference between our God and any of the false gods of the Old Testament. Any idol that you want to see in the Old Testament, any of the, the false gods, numerous, you can pray to those gods, they will not answer. Why? Because they don't hear. Why? Because they don't have ears. Why? Because they're not alive. You see? And so our God is the living God, so God hears. And so God, as David is experiencing this, he is saying, Lord, I, I'm crying out to you, but he, he has this confidence because the Lord has heard him and has answered him. Man, that is a confidence. It sounds so simple in our lives that when we're faced with things like this, trials, like what David is going through, sometimes we, don't, we think our prayer is just too simple of a thing. I want to challenge you today because Verse 4, we're going to look at later in the psalm what David actually prays. He prays for two things. We're going to show you in a minute. But simply the conviction that prayer is communication with God, that prayer is, is something whereby I can actually have communication with God, where he can hear me and I can hear from him. That, that there is an idea where if, uh, prayer for David, he's, he's expressing it here, as prayer is, is unlocking victory that he needs in his life. Man, I don't think we think of prayer like that. Uh, too many times we think of prayer in, 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 in Christianity today, we think about it as something we just do by habit. We do it by rote. We do it because, you know, that's how we open up our Sunday school class. We always pray. Uh, that's how we close the service. We always pray. So prayer is more functional than it is convictional. It's more of just that's what we're supposed to do rather than it's like, hey, this is what we need to do. And I think that's because David in this moment, he has nowhere else to turn. He has nowhere else to turn other than to the Lord in prayer. And sometimes we're too comfortable. We've got too many other uh, lifelines out there. We, we, we think of prayer as a, man, it's just a last resort, you know. Sometimes when we say, hey, we're going to pray, somebody will say, has it come to that? Have we really gotten to that place that we have to rely on prayer? And that's where we should begin. And, and church, that's the source of of power that's the source of anything good in our church family in our church fellowship it's not going to come from some creative idea we have it's not going to come from some initiative we take it's not going to come from some strategy it's going to come from the power of god in response to the prayers of his people and so as david is facing these challenges and these trials maybe you're facing challenges and trials or maybe life is going good for you i want to challenge you to develop a conviction about prayer, about the importance and the necessity of prayer. That's where victory is going to come in your life. It's through prayer. I want you to do a little mental exercise with me for a minute. Don't answer this out loud. Uh, I guess I've been talking to kids lately because I have, to, I have to say that. But sometimes you just need to say it. Don't answer this out loud, but I want you to just think about this question. When was the last time that you can think of where God specifically answered prayer in your life? You prayed about something, and you can point to a specific prayer you prayed and a specific response, specific answer. 
Have you got it? Are you thinking about that? Now, for some of us, that would be very easy. You would think, yep, okay, I prayed this, this week, and I heard God. God worked, and, and God responded. For others of us, that is a, like a fuzzy kind of thing. You're like, well, I don't really don't know, Brother Chris. And, and I, I'm not asking that question or bringing this question up to cause you embarrassment or, or to make you frustrated. I'm, I'm drawing your attention to something. And here's what I want to challenge you to do. You want to apply this psalm. This is a simple way in your life. You want to apply the words that he's saying here. Is I want to challenge you, if you can't think of a recent and specific way that God worked in response to prayer in your life, maybe that's because you haven't prayed recently in a specific way. You haven't seen, a, you haven't seen an answer because you haven't really been asking. You know, and so... Many times we, our prayers are so generic and so vanilla. I like vanilla, by the way. Anybody like vanilla? Why do they pick on vanilla? That's not fair. It's like, it's good. Anyway. But many times our prayers are like, you know, so how would you even know if God answered it? Lord, just help me to have a good day. Well, what does that look like? Lord, just please bless us today. Well, what does that look like? You're breathing, you're blessed. There you go, prayer's answered. But I'm pretty sure we mean more than that. But we don't ask. We don't specify. And, and many times I think it's this, because we're afraid to ask because we don't want to look stupid or we don't want to look, like, if I pray for this, God's going to be angry with me. Or if I, if I get too specific, I might be disappointed. But here, let the testimony of David encourage you. Let, it, let the testimony encourage you. Look at verse 4. I was crying to the Lord with my voice. What does he say? And he answered me. And he answered me. So today, if you don't have much history with God where you can say, well, I, I've been praying and God's answered, I'm telling you, nothing will build your faith more than when you call on the Lord and he answers and moves in response to prayers of his people. You, your faith is going to be growing what if you don't have that you've got david's testimony right here you've got him saying i called on the lord he answered me and we'll see in a minute as we put all this together that he did far more than just deliver david out of this temporary trouble he did far more than that so look at the the, the second thing that david expresses here verse five i lay down and slept i awoke for the lord sustained me so David knew, first of all, that God would hear him, but he had a second step, second conviction, was that he knew the Lord would sustain him. The Lord had done it before, he would do it again. So he says, I, and you think about something, he says, I lay down and slept. Remember, he's running for his life. When you're running for your life, a great strategy is not, hey, I'm gonna th I think I'm just going to take a nap. No, you run. But yet, David in that moment, could even rest with peace. Why? Because he knew the Lord would sustain him. Oftentimes, my kids are asleep. Uh, I'll, I'll just check on them, right? So I kind of open their door and look in their room and just make sure they're, they're okay, you know? And you just think about when you're asleep, you are completely unaware of anything around you. You're completely defenseless. You're completely helpless. You just think about that. That is the picture of a servant of God who's trusting the Lord. That's the picture of faith. Going to sleep. So uh, this afternoon, take a nap. You build your faith. Part of the sermon. That's step two. So first you pray, then you take a nap. For some of you, the first will lead to the second. It's going to be great. As you pray, you're going to fall asleep. It'll be great. But you're trusting in the Lord. I woke, why? For the Lord sustained me. Listen, this is, this is so deep theologically. We, we take it for granted. But if you woke up today, look at your neighbor and just check with them to make sure you woke up today. Just ask them real quick. Did you wake up today? Did you wake up? Am I, am I up today? If you woke up today, do you want to know why you woke up today? It's because the Lord sustains you. That's the grace of God in your life. And so you may be in a dark place, but guess what? God has sustained you this far, 
And he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. So he had this conviction that God would be sustaining him. And you know what that leads to in our lives? It leads to courage. When you are trusting in the Lord, you can live courageously. You can do what God's calling you to do. That's the testimony of David here. It's the testimony of every man and woman in Scripture who walked by faith and trusted in the Lord. You can live with courage. Look at verse 6, how he expresses that courage. I'll not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Why? Not because David is so strong. It's not because his army is so strong. Remember, they've all turned against him. Just about. He's running for his life. But he says, I'm not going to fear. Why? Because he is trusting in the Lord. Really, it doesn't matter who's against you. Because God is there with you, sustaining you. It doesn't matter how much the opposition is, how great the battle is. If the Lord is there, that is all you need. He is all you need. That's David's testimony. It doesn't matter if 10,000 are against you. The Lord will not wring his hands and say, oh my, what am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can't, I, can't, I can't help you. No, the Lord is not challenged whatsoever at all. And so look at verses 7 and 8. David finally has this conviction, not only that God will sustain him, but that God is the God who brings salvation to him. So look at verse 7. This is the content of his prayer. This is really interesting. Some of, the, some of you, this will really make you think. Some of you really struggle with this, but it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, verse 7, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Sometimes we get so pious that we don't pray. Like, some of you learned that prayer is using flowery, flowery, I can't even say it, flowery King James language to talk to God. Did you know that God does not speak King James? Like, you don't have to, like, speak 16th century English to get God's attention. You know, one of the greatest prayers that you could pray would be is those two words that we just read, oh, Lord. Save me. Save me. I mean, we make prayer out to be way more complicated than it is. Some of the best prayers, some of the most uh, prayers where you are connecting with God, it's not about the, the degree of words that you use, the theology you express in your prayers. Some of the best theology might be found in those two words. Lord, save me. Because it expresses my understanding that I can't save myself and the only one who can is God and I'm calling on his name. That's a great prayer. See, you might tell me today, well, I'm not much of a, a person of prayer. Well, put that in your, your prayer resume then. You, you don't need a, a course on that. Just call on his name. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. That's David's prayer. You make it out to be way more complicated than it is. So he had a conviction that God could save him, and so he called on his name. He says, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you, and he says, you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Now, some of us read um, that, and we get kind of sanctimonious. I can't believe that's in the Bible. Some of you are thinking that right now. That's kind of violent. Is that violent, or is it just me? It's kind of violent, right? But how ironic that that would offend us. We live in one of the most violent cultures ever. We entertain ourselves by watching people beat the tar out of one another, right? And that's what we do. If you watch a movie and it doesn't have somebody beating somebody else up, I probably don't want to watch it. It's probably boring. You know, people just holding hands, skipping through the, the field, whatever. That's not a movie. There's no plot. There's got to be a bad guy. There's got to be a fight of some kind, right? And so there's an expression here of this is real life. This is real prayer. So don't, don't act all sanctimonious. Like, so look at what's happening here. He is, David is praying, and he's praying in a way. He's, he's praying about this situation with his enemies. He's praying also kind of in the future tense, like God's already answered his prayer. And so he says, you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You've shattered the teeth of the wicked. The, the picture there is of what David is feeling in his heart. Have you ever wanted to express 
uh, verse 7 towards somebody? Right? So sometimes we, we think like, like God doesn't know that. Like, you can express, part of prayer is expressing your heart to God. So David is dealing with these enemies who are coming against him. This is a real prayer coming as the cry of his heart. You bring it to God, let him sort it out. He's not going to tell you, hey, I think you need to go over there and beat them up. That's not really going to be the application. Just in just case you're wondering, Jesus, Jesus helped us understand that a little bit. But part of prayer is expressing those things to God. So normally what we do instead of telling the Lord those things is we, we speak them to others. Or we... we we, we come up with all kinds of other ways, and we don't deal with it. So take these things to the Lord. And so he brings this prayer uh, to the Lord. And the imagery here in verse 7 is of an enemy of almost, he's talking about his enemies, but he's speaking of them as a wild animal almost. Talks about their, their teeth being shattered, broken out. Why? Because if, if a wild beast doesn't have teeth, what? They can't devour you. So there's the picture. His enemies are disarmed. That's what he's praying for. In other words, they won't be successful in their work. Why? Verse 8. Because he's trusting in this. His conviction is this. Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. My challenge to you today, as we try to bring this message to a close, is I want to call you to trust in the Lord. Maybe you're faced with a situation like we're describing here got enemies and obstacles people are mocking you for your commitment to christ maybe everything's going great in your life but you need to be equipped for a season where it isn't that's why this so you can file this message away because there's going to come a time where you need it but i think one of the great challenges we face is we we fear taking that step to really trust god because we're afraid of being disappointed I want to say something about that. A few weeks ago, uh, I went to uh, my favorite restaurant. Um, as a kid, uh, just fast food, whatever, it was always Dairy Queen. That was my favorite thing as a kid. And uh, still is to this day. My favorite ice cream is I get the ice cream cone, but I get it dipped in the chocolate. Anybody give a witness to the chocolate dipped ice cream cone? That's my favorite thing. And so I was at Dairy Queen, and I ordered uh, something for Lauren, and I ordered my chocolate dip ice cream cone. We sat down, and I waited. They said, hey, it's going to be a few minutes. So we waited at the table, and they were going to bring the ice cream to us. So we're sitting there at the table, and the, the uh, attendant comes up. She brings the uh, thing that my wife had ordered, and she brings me this, this cup of, of ice cream. And uh, she said, here's your blizzard. And I was like, man, that's weird. Because ice cream cone and blizzard don't really... They don't sound the same, at least in English. I don't, I don't know. So I was like, um, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I actually really wanted an ice cream cone. That's what, I, that's what I ordered. And she was like, oh, okay. So I said, hey, I would really like that chocolate dip ice cream cone. And so she said, okay, no problem. I'll make it right. So she went back to the kitchen and then came back a few minutes later and she had my ice cream cone, except it wasn't dipped in chocolate. And at this point, I was like, Jesus, I love you, and I want to represent you well. And so I was like, I just said, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I just ignored it. And so I sat there eating my ice cream cone that's vanilla and is not dipped in chocolate, and I just ate it. And every bite I took, I was like, this would be better, would have been better. This would have been so much better if it was dipped in chocolate. And so I got all the way to the end, and I was like, man, that would have, it was good, but it could have been better. I would be wrong to conclude from that experience that I should never go to Dairy Queen again, that I should never order a chocolate dip ice cream cone again because I didn't get it from that one time and that one place. That's how some of us are with God. We're, uh, we're afraid to trust him because we might be disappointed about something because, well, if I trust God with this, what if God doesn't answer? What if I pray about this specifically? What if I pray about this situation in my job? What if I pray about this relationship? What if I pray about this person who needs the Lord? What if I get really specific? What if I trust God and get radically committed to him? And what if God doesn't do what I expect him to do? I don't want to face that disappointment. Now, listen, you may have a situation that does not happen according to your plans you can trust God with all kinds of things and God may have a different plan but let me tell you something 
Look at, look at the end of verse 8. I want you to see this conviction. Salvation belongs to the Lord. When you trust God, you will be, you'll never be disappointed. When it comes to the thing that matters most, salvation belongs to the Lord. You can no more de- be disappointed if you trust God with your eternity, with your salvation, than if you were to be able to put Christ back in the grave. You to keep him from rising from the dead. No, it's already happened. He's alive. Your your trust in the Lord will not be in vain. And so if that's true in the matter of salvation, which by the way, that's the connection to this whole story. Because God made a covenant with David that through David, the Messiah would come. And so David's trust in the Lord wasn't just about David. It was about the Messiah. It was about salvation for all mankind. And so this passage isn't about just God helping us out of our troubles, temporarily speaking, but about for eternity. And so I want to challenge you to do two things today. For those of you who are believers in Jesus, I want our, our worship team to come right now and uh, lead us in our, our invitation. As our worship team is coming, as a believer, my challenge to you today is I come back to verse 4. I challenge you guys today to get serious and specific in your prayer life, to start trusting God. Maybe there's a burden that you have right now today where where as we read this psalm, you're like, I'm in that lament mode, Brother Chris. I'm there. I'm dealing with stuff right now. That's what this time is for. I invite you even to come to this altar this morning and just lay those burdens there. Maybe you want to pray with someone. Our pastors are going to be here at the front. We would love to pray with you and encourage you about whatever situation you're facing but the greatest need in this room today the greatest need for you to trust in the lord salvation belongs to the lord see you can't do anything on your own to save you you can't go to enough church services you can't uh, do enough good deeds you can't give enough to the church you can't serve enough hours none of those things will save you but that's why jesus came he came to live a perfect sinless life he died on a cross to pay the price for your sin he rose from the dead he offers forgiveness and eternal life and some of you today that's what you need is to trust in jesus christ maybe you've heard that your whole life but you've never put your trust in him couldn't think of a better day than today than right now to put your faith in jesus christ call on him to be saved i want to ask you just to bow your head with me all across the room Maybe you need to take that step today and give your life to Jesus right now. I want to invite you to pray with me. I'm going to lead in a prayer. And if this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, the faith that that God is stirring in you in these moments, there's nothing about my words that matter. Only about faith in Jesus. And so if that's you, if God's speaking to you, drawing you to, to himself today, would you just pray with me? Just in your heart as I lead out loud would you first pray something like this dear God today I confess that I'm a sinner God I confess that I need you to save me Lord I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me I thank you that he died on the cross I thank you that he rose from the dead God, I confess today that Jesus is Lord. God, I pray you'd help me to live the rest of my life for Jesus Christ. I want to ask everyone just to remain for a moment with your head bowed and with your eyes closed. I want to ask that nobody look around right now. Nobody uh, worry about what anybody else is doing. But I want to ask you something. I want to ask you to do something bold. Just to be unashamed to declare today that if you prayed to receive Christ, that you would say, you know what? I want somebody to know about that. And our pastors here, we just want to be able to pray for you. We're not going to point you out. We just want to be able to pray for you. So if you, if you prayed with me to trust Christ, would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking around. Would you just lift your hand up and say, I did that today. Amen. There's some hands that are going up. Just put it back down. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you that you are a God who saves. 
who rescues. So, Father, today we want to trust you, whether it's with salvation today. Pray for those who have just publicly said, I I trusted Christ today. God, I pray that you help them to take the next steps in their faith and declaring that publicly. Father, I pray for for those of us who just need a a place of refuge today. We're dealing with difficulties and, and trials. Lord, today I pray, Father, we'd find comfort in these words of Scripture, God, that you would stir our hearts as we sing together in these moments. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand with us all across the room. Our worship team is going to lead us. You just do business with God. Maybe that's coming to this altar. Maybe you need to pray with someone. Maybe there's some other decision that God is working in your life. You just obey the Lord right now as he leads you.